Russia has been rattling its sabers in the direction of Ukraine in recent weeks, amassing some 100,000 soldiers near the smaller country's borders. Is Europe facing a Russian invasion of Ukraine? What will the United States do in response? And, of course, what will the Europeans do? What is the historical background to Russia's threats to Ukraine? Welcome to International Horizons, a podcast of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies that brings scholarly and diplomatic expertise to bear on our understanding of a wide range of international issues. My name is John Torpy, and I'm director of the Ralph Bunch Institute at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Today, we discuss the crisis between Russia and Ukraine with Susan Smith-Peter, who's professor of history at the College of Staten Island uh, in the CUNY system. Professor Smith-Peter has written extensively about 18th and 19th century Russian history, especially with regard to regional identities outside the major capitals of Moscow and St. Petersburg. Her most recent book is Imagining Russian Regions, Civil Society and Subnational Identity in 19th Century Russia, which was published by Brill in 2018. And of course, you can see from her expertise why we would want to have her come and talk about the issues today. Thanks so much for joining us today, Susan Smith-Peter. Thanks, John. I'm really glad to be here. And I'm excited to be able to talk about Ukraine and Russia in a long term historical perspective, because that's something that isn't always present in the commentary that we uh, read and, and hear. So when we're talking about what's going on with uh, the crisis in Ukraine, I mean, we need to start with some basics. And one of them is just a simple statement that Ukraine is its own country. Uh, Ukraine has its own language. Uh, I'm fluent in Russian. I studied Ukraine uh, and Ukrainian. Uh, and I can say that, you know, it's not just a dialect. It does sound different. Uh, sometimes when you're reading Ukrainian, it's easier because you can understand and figure out the roots of the language. And sometimes they're, they're uh, quite similar. But it really is its own um, its own sort of history, culture, language, all that sort of stuff. Now, I would kind of call what's going on historiographical warfare, historiographical in the sense of different ways of writing history. And one of the things I base this on is actually Putin's own statement. Putin wrote a statement, uh, quite an extensive one, called On the Hist- on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. It was actually so long that Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, kind of uh, said, you know, it's uh, obviously Putin has a lot of time on his hands. But one of the interesting things about this statement is that it's very historiographical in its nature. It's very detailed. It gives a, a retelling of the relations between the Russians and the Ukrainians and uh, Russian scholars, I mean, Russian historians in Russia, uh, very much critiqued it and said it was anachronistic and said that the idea of the people that he uses and projects back into the past is a 19th century idea. And, and that's all true. But one of the things that struck me is that it's very similar to one of the very first historical works in Russian that encompassed the uh, Ukrainian people, which was uh, Nikolai Ustrov in 1839. He wrote a book called Russian History. And in that history, he talked about how Russia, Russian Empire had to regather its lands. And those lands were Belarus and Ukraine. And this happens through the partitions of Poland. I'm not going to get into all of that right now. But the interesting thing about Ustrov and why it's so similar to to Putin is that Ustrov can considers that any time that Ukraine is not united with Russia, it's because of 
uh, foreigners and the machinations of foreigners, especially Poles. And it's just tremendously similar to the way Putin presents the Ukrainians in on the historical unity, where he just really seems to feel that uh, Ukrainians have absolutely no agency as a people and that any time they try to separate themselves from Russia, it's because of the evil machinations of foreigners, uh, you know, originally Poles uh, and then Austrians, then, of course, the CIA uh, and, and the Americans. And it's it's all sort of part of this larger view that uh, Ukraine has no ability to even make its own arguments or to have its own history. And one of the things that's difficult for the West to understand about this conflict is that it's it has at its core uh, a, a conflict over a sacred origin. So the sacred origin is Kievan Rus. Kievan Rus is the first um, kind of important state uh, state in uh, East, uh, East Slavic lands. And so, um, you know, we're, t- we're talking you know, uh, like 10th century, 19th I'm, I'm, century. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, uh, you know, I was going to ask you about the Kievan Rus, uh, of course, because it does seem to be regarded as kind of the origin of... Right of later Russia, um, and hence this would give some people the idea that these things were obviously deeply, you know, interconnected and might, someone might still think of it that way. But, um, so I wonder if you could talk about, you know, how that's perceived among contemporary Russians. Uh, I mean, today's Russians. Is that something they, you know, are aware of? I mean, presumably they're aware of it, at least in some dim way. Um, how oh, yeah. does that affect okay. their thinking about this region? Oh yes, absolutely. They're they're aware of it. I mean, Russians are very well versed in their history. Um, the Russian history without Kiev and Rus doesn't really make a lot of sense. It would sort of be a similar situation if American history was in a situation where only Boston could talk about Lexington and Concord and Paul Revere and the, and the American Revolution and uh, the rest of the country could only begin the narrative with the War of 1812. It doesn't make sense to start the American um, historical narrative with the War of 1812 because the American Revolution is sort of a sacred origin story. So Ukrainians would object to that because they would say that, you know, this is, uh, you know, suggesting that Russia is really part of, uh, that Ukraine is really part of Russia, but I'm just using that as an example. So, yes, it's still very much on people's minds. It's still very much part of the uh, origin of Russian history and historiography, uh, even in very you know, um, very well done and professional histories. And this debate goes all the way back to the 1850s uh, between these two uh, historians at the time, and it continues up to the present. So it's now it's seen as a sort of zero sum game where either Ukraine or Russia can have the ability to say that Kiev and Rus is its origin, but not both. Um, one could make the argument that Kiev is the true, um, you know, success. Capital or the uh-huh. capital. Yeah, that that Ukraine itself is the, is the true success, to, true successor to Kiev and Rus. So, yes, this is still very much a big, big problem. And you, you can go back to uh, ideas about Ukraine that were developed in the Enlightenment, which had tremendous influence and continuing influence on Russian views of Ukraine, because in the Enlightenment, the view even among Ukrainians, even among people who lived in Ukraine and were interested in Ukraine, was that Ukraine Ukrainian itself was a peasant language, that it wasn't a universal culture, uh, that it was a particular culture. Um, And then in the 1820s, you get Ukrainians saying, wait a second, look at romanticism. Peasants are wonderful and Ukrainian language is more authentic and it's real and we can collect the uh, Ukrainian folklore. And that division um, really continues to this day with a lot of Russians 
um, including just regular members of the intelligentsia saying, oh, Ukrainian is so peasant. It's not it's you know, it's it's just doesn't have the same kind of status. It's it's not as a language of high culture like Russian. And a lot of that goes back to these uh, enlightenment ideas. And of course, enlightenment is not always uh, a wonderful, perfect thing. So, you know, these kind of contested aspects have been going on for a long time. And one of the main things that we see, and we see it also in the second half of the 19th century, is that the Russians uh, in the Russian Empire are very worried that Ukrainian language could lead to Ukrainian claims to autonomy and maybe even to nationalism. And so the Russians take these various uh, actions to suppress Ukrainian, to suppress written Ukrainian, spoken Ukrainian. Uh, and what does this do? It actually encourages the development of a Ukrainian identity that's very much separate from Russian. And, you know, we see a similar process happening today where, ironically enough, uh, ironically enough, the Ukrainian identity before Euromaidan and before the invasion um, of Ukraine and, you know, Crimea and, and Donbass, uh, there was actually not as much of a strongly developed different identity. I mean, there was a different one, but many people were watching Russian TV. Many people were very influenced by Russian narratives. And one of the somewhat expected, if you're an outside viewer, but unintended consequences of this long running uh, conflict is that the sense of difference in Ukraine is much greater now than it was in 2013. And in some ways, I can compare that to the 19th century, where you have this, uh, you know, the, the Russian state is, is constantly trying to prevent the uh, discussion of Ukrainian and what does it do? It leads to an intensified sense of Ukrainian identity, history, language, and all all of those good things. So, uh, so those are the longer, the deeper stakes. Yes. So, uh, I mean, obviously, this is an important point that uh, you're saying that there's a kind of greater sense of national difference among Ukrainians in the recent past in the last decade or so, perhaps less than that. But um, and yet, you know, from Putin's perspective, I mean, Putin, as you know, famously said that he thought the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. So he presumably is looking at this from a different perspective. I mean, you know, when uh, Ukrainians hear, you know, about the Soviet Union, they may think of the Great Famine of, I've forgotten now exactly, 1930, I think, right? Mm. Um, and so, uh, but but apparently that, you know, to some degree was uh, papered over in, in intervening years. So I, I guess, you know, if you could talk a little bit about the differing perceptions of the unity or disunity or unity or di and division uh, between these two you know, entities um, over the 20th century. Yeah, so uh, the Great Terror Famine, Holodomor, uh, that was uh, 1932 to 33, it killed, according to pretty uh, important uh, and accurate uh, estimates, about 3.9 million uh, people, mostly Ukrainians. So, yes, um, one of the things that's interesting here is I, I want to go back to the question of Putin and his and his view of uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So Putin has this sense of the collapse of the Soviet Union as this terrible catastrophe. And in many ways, it was, but because of what happened in the 90s. And what happened in the 90s is that the United States completely forgot the lessons of Versailles. Uh, that was just absolutely out of the window. And instead, there was a sense that Russia is not in the near future going to become a competitor. So therefore, it can be humiliated. But the problem is that when humiliation occurs, it's very difficult for that to be resolved in a way that isn't violent. So in the 90s, the Russians were accepting a lot of advice from the United States. And I'm not going to get into all the details, but, but that advice 
said that there should be this very fast um, kind of modernization and that there should be privatization uh, and that the market should take care of everything. And the result really was an absolute catastrophe. I mean, millions of people died uh, when they didn't have to. And this is this is actually Western scholarship. It's not Russian uh, nationalist stuff. And I mean, I saw myself things like uh, these veterans from World War II, or as they call it, the uh, Great Patriotic War, begging on their knees with all of their uh, medals on their chest, begging on their knees with a cap in the hand. And, you know, I saw things like I remember in the crisis of, of 1998, uh, there was a Borzoi dog uh, that was begging at the uh, I was in a provincial town. Uh, and the Borzoi is a very aristocratic dog. Well, why was it begging? Well, a lot of dogs had been kicked out by their owners because their owners could have only two choices. They would either not eat themselves uh, and feed their dogs or eat themselves and kick out their dog. So this dog was wandering from stall to stall in the meat part of the market. And it was just clearly so confused. Why? Am I not getting food? Why am I hungry? Well, I was always fed before this. And I remember that, you know, uh, so that kind of level of humiliation is very, very difficult to to process. And if the United States had actually kind of remembered Versailles and carried out a Marshall Plan, we would be in a totally different situation right now because it would have been certainly much more possible to have a stable and democratic Russia if that this 1990s had not been so incredibly traumatic. And Putin is always talking about the 90s as this origin of his legitimacy. He's always saying, you know, look at where we were in the 90s, you know, how humiliated we were, and I've made us a strong country again. Uh, we are now again a, a real force in the world and actually the 90s are part of the reason why his uh, power is to some degree diminishing because the new generation you know the 90s for them is they weren't around maybe they were born maybe they weren't even born yet and so it doesn't have a visceral kind of appeal to them so it was a really great catastrophe but the catastrophe did not necessarily have to be as great as it was. It was incredibly uh, intensified by the actions that were taken. And of course, you could say, OK, Yeltsin should not have taken the advice of the Americans. But, um, you know, equally, you could say the Americans should not have, you know, taken this stance that they did. But. You know, it's part of the, the larger kind of thing of what was going on at the time. I mean, this is a, a very harsh era uh, where you have uh, the 1994 crime bill in this country. You have uh, this kind of end of war of, of welfare and this this kind of harshness that was very much part of Bill Clinton's time. Uh, and that harshness was incredibly intensified in Russia, where it really just was uh, red and tooth and claw. And the people that were not able to make it in the market, uh, including old people, uh, people with disabilities, uh, they, they, they just uh, died. You know, yeah, so. I think it might be useful, uh, you know, for some of our listeners who may not be getting uh, some of these historical mm -hmm. references, but uh, to say a little bit more about, you know, exactly what happened, uh, it, you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, I mean, you're comparing it to Versailles, which, you know, again, may not be immediately, uh, you know, comprehensible. For some people. So maybe you could say in, in some greater detail, you know, exactly what happened with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Sure. Um, I mean, one thing was, as you say, an, an enormous mortality uh, that was related to, you know, the collapse of the economy and uh, massive increases in alcoholism and all kinds of things. So can you make a little bit more explicit what you mean when you compare this to what happened in Versailles? So what I mean is, there was a sense that this is a, an enemy that no longer 
uh, is going to be a problem, that the victory can be a very harsh one, and that uh, a kind of peace can be imposed on them without considering how it will really be seen from the point of view of the people uh, who were defeated. So, so that's, that's what I mean. So what happened in the, the collapse of the, the Soviet Union? Well, Ukraine was very important in actually kind of saying we, we don't want to be part of the Soviet Union. That was absolutely crucial to the collapse of it. And there was what happened in basically is all the different Republics of the Soviet Union over time, it was a relatively short period of time, uh, in 1990, were, they were basically deciding that they were not going to stay within the Soviet Union. And at the end of, of 1991, uh, you have this decision to end the Soviet Union. So, and in some ways, when you look at it, when you study it, it's it's a very strange, almost <laughs> mystical kind of thing. I mean, there's a decision that's made, uh, which is almost like, you know, tomorrow your country will no longer cease to exist. Please make a note of it. And one of the things that's really important to understand here is that Gorbachev, who was, of course, the head of the Soviet Union at the time, was a tremendous idealist. And somebody who was less idealistic probably would have fought to keep it. But he was not willing to go to war to keep the Soviet Union over the will of the people of the constituent republics. So there was a decision to let the Soviet Union end. And so then what results are all the different states that we see now, the Russian Federation, Ukraine, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all of those states which had been before part of the larger Soviet Union became independent and they had their own foreign policy, their own defense and so on and so forth. So that's that's what happened there. And then what happened after that in Russia was this era of humiliation and destruction and just completely uncontrolled market forces and people. Yes, some people were able to do well and it was a time of great hope uh, in some strange ways. I I miss it for that. Uh, but for from the vast majority of the Russian people, it was a truly terrible time. But if it had been managed better, the collapse of the Soviet Union might have been turned into an opportunity to create a civic nation in the Russian Federation, a nation where the the people who are part of the nation are not just ethnic Russians, but uh but Russian citizens, the way that Yeltsin used to always refer, refer to that was Russianya, which I still remember from, to this day. And that means Russianya means, uh, you know, the citizens of Russia. So they could be Buryat, they could be Tatar, I mean, many different non-Russian uh, ethnic groups. And if they'd had more support and a um, less harsh kind of introduction to the uh, market, it's possible that that kind of civic nation could have emerged. And if that were to have happened, then you wouldn't really need this drive to reclaim the Russian lands, which is based on wanting to get revenge on what happened in the past and uh, to make sure that there's still kind of empire. Um, if you had a civic Russian nation, you, you'd just be looking at a completely different situation. So I I do feel that the collapse itself is a catastrophe because of what happened afterward, not necessarily because of the real nature of what happened to the Soviet Union, because the Russian right. Federation could easily be a great power even without uh, a reconstituted uh, Soviet Union. Right. 
But it sounds as though this, you know, post-Soviet history really must shape everything that Putin thinks about the world. And it must be informing, you know, in some respects, you know, his thinking right now. But uh, I have to say, it seems to me there's extraordinary sort of confusion and uh, lack of consensus about what Putin seems to want in the current situ- current situation. I mean, do you think you can shed any light on that question? Well, Going back to the whole historiographical war idea, I I think it's in many ways, it's a reflection of the historiographical debate about Putin, not because people who are commenting on Putin today know about the historiography of Putin, but because there's there's like a real thing that's being discussed. And in the historiography, there's some people who say Putin just wants money. He uh, stole a lot of stuff. And, you know, it's it's about assuring his continued existence uh, and uh, e- extraordinary personal fortune. And there are other people who say, no, Putin really believes in what he believes and what he believes has to do with Eurasianism and a whole bunch of other things uh, that I don't have to get into at this particular moment. So that debate in some ways is going on now with trying to figure out what does Putin want? If you're taking the point of view that Putin is just motivated by these, you know, basic economic drives, per se, you could say, well, he wants Ukraine because he wants the, you know, the resources, for example. If you're looking at it as a sort of historiographical thing and in terms of ideological, uh, you can make the argument, which is closer to what I'm making, that it has to do with uh, a sense of Russia can't really be an empire without Ukraine. It's sort of incomplete without Ukraine. So it's very difficult to know which one of those is, is definitely correct. I mean, I myself sometimes feel that Putin doesn't really believe anything. And then sometimes I feel, well, yes, he does have he does have a belief system and the belief system uh, is organized around how can Russia become a great power. Right. And what are what are the underpinnings of ideology and beliefs and values that are against the West. And so he's engaged in a search for those and he's found various answers. But underlying the search is always how can we assist a system of values that's not like the West. So what does Putin want? I mean, it's just it's difficult to know. Uh, it is really difficult to know. And it, it's it's not just because there isn't enough information. It's also because the information is is conflicting. And so, I mean, if I knew what Putin wanted, I probably wouldn't be here. I probably You'd be on the National Security here. You'd be on the <laughs> yeah. National Security Council. I'd be on CNN. You're right. All right. Exactly. Um, so unfortunately I don't really have I don't really have the, the answer, but I I do know that if you just completely dismiss the ideas it, it impoverishes our understanding of what Putin is about. I I do think the ideas play some kind of role here. And certainly the idea that Russia was humiliated and that Russia must get revenge or uh, reestablish itself, that idea is more basic than an ideology. It's kind of like a, a feeling. And that's real. I don't doubt for a second that that's real. So, you know, but then again, Putin, you know, he was a KGB agent. He's very good at hiding his feelings and his thoughts. And he's also very good at, you know, this whole idea of Maskarovka, which is playing with different masks and um, which is, can often be a way of distracting people, saying one thing, doing another. Uh, but that sense of humiliation and that desire for revenge, that, that is a thread that goes through. And strangely enough, at the very beginning, um, he hoped to kind of uh, do this by becoming more pro-Western. Uh, and this is something that's often forgotten. And the European Union and others uh, didn't really accept that. Uh, and so if he's going to be rejected, he might as well completely reject them. So, you know, you, you see a similar process with, with Turkey, actually. But in any case, yes, um, 
what is he going to do? Very hard to know. I can I have speculations. I have ideas what would be logical, but unfortunately, it's hard to really say. Well, I mean, I think there's one theory out there among many uh, that suggests that, you know, his his interest in perhaps invading or biting off another chunk of Ukraine, uh, you know, runs parallel with his interests in power and wealth in his own position. That is to say, you know, that by doing this, he shores up his, you know, domestic uh, prestige. Uh, I mean, what do you think of I mean, that seems in some ways kind of uncon- incontrovertible, I suppose, but uh, it doesn't tell us really exactly what he's going to do. But uh, it does seem to be a kind of plausible argument about what's maybe going on. Yeah. I mean, that's, as I said, the, the historiographical debate, one of them is, is more about him uh, making sure that he is able to control his own wealth and his own standing, his own status. I mean, one of the reasons why he's so terrified by these color revolutions is that he's is afraid that he could be overturned and dragged through the streets like uh, Gaddafi and so on and so forth. So, so yeah, that is a possibility. But then when we when we see the choice of Ukraine, the choice of Ukraine is not random. I mean, the choice of Ukraine has to do with, I mean, in 2008, uh, NATO said that Ukraine and Georgia would in the future be able to join NATO. And that that's a big problem, uh, primarily for Ukraine and Georgia, because then Putin after that, uh, started the war on Georgia, and it's a long-range uh, reason for what's going on in Ukraine. Um, so you you do see this as one of the one of the reasons why he is choosing Ukraine. And then you also have this historiographical thing, where if you want to celebrate the whole long history of Russia, Ukraine is a very important part of that history, and he's denying that it has a right to make any of its own decisions. So, yes, but it's also sort of yes and, right? Yes, he needs to shore up his support, which has been eroding because you have this new generation that doesn't even remember the 90s, which is the main justification. So one way you can kind of bring in those people is by saying, Look, we're expanding. We're being taken seriously. Uh, look at how great this country is. And it's not just about the 90s. It's about the things that I can provide Russia with now. But, you know, it's, it's not, it's not just that. Understood. Well, I think that's been a very helpful discussion of the historical background to what you know, may be a march to war in Ukraine on the part of the Russians it remains to be seen, although it seems to me that the talk of war has gotten even louder in the last 24 hours. So much to be concerned about, but I think much uh, to be understood from historical perspective. So I want to thank Susan Smith-Peter for sharing her thoughts about the crisis in Ukraine and Russia and its historical background. Remember to subscribe and rate International Horizons on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. I want to thank Osvaldo Mena Aguilar for his technical assistance, as well as to thank Meryl Sovner for helping put this show together, and to acknowledge Duncan McKay for sharing his song, International Horizons, as the theme music for the show. This is John Torpy saying thanks for joining us, and we look forward to having you with us for the next episode of International Horizons. International Horizons.